All right, so welcome everybody. Um, this is our penultimate uh, ME research seminar. We'll have a speaker next week um, as well. But here's Dr. T, who's the newest member of the mechanical engineering department. And I think that next week there's a, a colleague yep. of yours from the University of Hawaii who yep. we'll, we'll all get on a plane and go visit him. And <laughs> that's how it works. All right, so, so Dr. T will talk about his research today, and then we'll retire after the talk at three o'clock to the Emmys due for some light refreshments. So okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So yeah, I will, I've tried my best to reduce the number of equations out there, make, try to keep it very top level. There might be a few equations out here and there, but you don't have to worry about the equation part. Just get the We're gist and that's it. Equation. Sorry? Okay. Then if you had only told me before, I would have put all like 50 slides of equations there. <laughs> but yeah, I tried to keep it top level to most part and like keep it a bit broad. Uh, it's more digestible. But yeah, I guess to start off with, right? Uh, right, one of the biggest assumptions we talk about and I think I talked about in our class, right? when I was subbing with uh, Dr. McCon's class, I mentioned it as well, like in mechanics or mechanical engineering or in general engineering make is a continuum assumption, right? You always make that assumption by default, even without knowing you're doing that, right? And most of the things work based on that assumption. If that breaks down many of the things that are on top, built on top of it, you're kind of stuck, right? So what do you do or what do the challenges that you have when you come to a point like when you're at the limits of that, right? When the assumption itself is challenged, right? When you're talking about features that are like, are so thin in length scales, right? Or in time scales as well, right? Uh, uh, you're uh, some of uh, Dr. Diwakar's students, right? You guys are working with pulse laser that are like femtoseconds, right? It's the pulses are femtoseconds, right? What do you do when you're that, that small of a time scale, right? Uh, so part of it is kind of, talking about that aspect and how do you capture things when you're at that length scales and time scales. Uh, most of the work, since I'm more of a fluid background person, will be more focused on fluids per se, but the basic fundamental theory that I'm presenting here or the approach or the methodology is like, it's more act applicable or that's what we're hoping it looks like it is, is applicable across the board, right? Uh, that's where you guys come in, right? Pick it up and use it other places where you can. Okay, so going with that, just a brief outline. So I'll be presenting some just examples so you guys can relate to when I'm talking about at the continuum limits, right? What are the kind of features or discontinuities or singularities that I'm talking about, right? Uh, so I'll present some of the examples there and then kind of talk about the fact that in reality, right? These discontinuities are a mathematical construct so that you can use continuum assumptions, so you can use calculus and all of that fun stuff, right? But in physically in nature, there is no discontinuity, right? There's no mathematical discontinuity that is there, uh, right? So when you have something a feature which physically has certain thickness, right, still, uh, and you're going to a mathematical construct of a limiting discontinuity, right? How do you do that? and do it in a way that still captures accurately everything that was there physically to begin with, right? Uh, and that's kind of the approach we are building up to. Uh, and then kind of to find, summarize and finish up, I'll kind of show more examples or show that different places where you see this discontinuities and some of them are like not necessarily physically dis discontinuous in nature uh, as we think about it, but like sometimes they use it just for convenience sake, for solving problem, like vortex sheet, right? You use boundary layer, you have boundary layer, you can use vortex sheet to capture a boundary layer. That's more for simplicity of solving or modeling the problem there, right? Um, so yeah, so with that, we'll get into more of this, right? So one of the most common examples and some of my doctoral work was related to this was the material interface, right? Right, it's essentially the boundary, right? If you think about this board, the table, the boundary of the surface is an interface, right? There is a discontinuity between the end of this, the density changes rapidly from here to there, right? 
Uh, the other places that you have seen here is liquids, right? You always talk about two different immiscible liquids or partially miscible, right? There's a rapid change in density between the two, right? Uh, often, and we'll get into more, right? When into this, like when you are representing a discontinuous surface, right? In your, if you're drawing a schematic or a free body diagram, you literally draw a mathematical line, right? You don't see it as, oh, it's going to be a slight shade thickness with a sharp gradient intensity, right? That's not how it is done, or that's part of the simplicity or assumptions that you're making. Going past the mathematical inter or material interface is shock fronts, right? Something that everybody likes and talks about, right? Most of the time when you're talking about shocks, the thing that comes into mind is always explosion, right? You can see there's a wave ahead of the actual explosion of the mass that is going on, right? Uh, and that's the one other thing that comes into mind, right? But uh, here is an example of when it comes to astrophysics, right? Uh, explosions of sun and other cosmic stars phenomenon. I think so. Let me just quickly change the people coming in. Yeah, so essentially, uh, you have some mem uh, researchers in Georgia Tech who are trying to recreate in a lab a supernova, features of a supernova, right? And it's pretty neat that way, but essentially they're creating an explosion that creates, recreates some of the features there, right? So, so those are also like, when you talk about shock fronts, you have ahead of the front, you have everything calm and quiet, There's a, but behind the front, right? Everything is chaotic. You have a sharp increase in density, pressure, temperature, right, as it moves ahead. Um, and one of the first examples was related to the standard explosion or when you talk about in planes and stuff. But then you have other areas where this is apparent and observable is where it comes to like even like cosmic things, right? The second place where you have this, right, is when you have a chemical reaction, right? Uh, this is a certain quick pure clay, and the reaction is started by heating in the bottom part. And you can see the propagation of the reaction going, right? So, as again, right, behind this reaction front, you have everything that like the com chemical composition has changed, the temperature has changed, but ahead of it, for some reason, it's decides to draw a small region. Uh, uh, but ahead of it, there's a different, completely uh, scenario out there, right? So you have that. So essentially, this becomes your discontinuity, right? You have a sudden change in properties, in temperature, in thermodynamic quantities, right? And the next one is for people in thermal sites as well, right? If you have a flame or propagating, I can try to kind of speak this up rather than going through the whole thing. So essentially, this is the propagation of a flame, right, through a thin, narrow channel, right? The same thing. This front itself, you represent it always as a discontinuous mathematical line, right? Uh, and for people who are more in solid mechanics, right, uh, do, do stuff with materials, right? Uh, you have two different geometries. When it's in contact, you create a surface, right? If it's welded, and if you're trying to shrink the top one, right, it's going to, normally, if it's going to shrink, it will shrink in one dimension and it will do independently. But if it's joined on that area, you have like stress concentration around that edge out there, right? So that also forms like a singularity out there. So you often you see failures or fractures happening from stress concentration areas or stress singularity regions, right? So, and then, so far, we have talked about like independent, right? You have you have one type of singularity or discontinuous like shock or a material or a flame. But what happens if these things interact with each other, right? That generates another types of singularity. So it's not like it has to be independent. Uh, here you see a shock interacting with a bubble. So essentially, a shock with a material interface. Uh, on this side, this is a flame that they ignite and then they the shock ahead of it propagates and hit a bubble, which then leads to a detonation uh, at the end, right? So you have more complex phenomena that is happening, right? 
and it is of interest. So, so I'll show this specific region, right? So you, this is the short front. This is the interface formed by the bubble, right? Uh, and you see that the way this two interact, right? That creates another discontinuity, right? Two surfaces interacting will create a line, right? And all you can see that this feature that is developed originates from that line, right? So it is also of importance to kind of try and figure out how to properly capture or model some of these quantities or uh, discontinuous or similar features, right? So going back to the fact that I was trying to make, right? You have these things in nature, depending on the field you are, one way or the other, you might have seen it or heard about it, right? Uh, but it's always generally when you are doing in classwork and in good portion of research, right, as well, you model this as a mathematical line, right? It's as a discontinuous function there, right? Uh, but physically, it is not, right? So here is just a molecular dynamic simulation of a two phase or two material, two fluids uh, in a QUET flow, right? The standard flow. So because you are at the molecular scales, you are able to see that even though this line, which is, if you're drawing in fluids class or any class, like you'll be drawing the mathematical line, right? But it actually has a thickness and there is actually mass across it, right? The two fluids will, there'll be some molecules passing by it, unless you can create a perfectly hydrophobic material that is not going to come much out, right? Then, the, then still there'll be thickness, but there might not be any material in it, right? So essentially, even though you are represented as a mathematical line, it has a thickness and it has matter in it, right? There's matter, that means it has properties connected with it and parameters associated. Uh, similarly, this is uh, essentially the density profile of a shock front uh, simulated using molecular dynamic simulations again. So, which essentially again shows that even though shock front you also generally model is as perfect line, right? It has a thickness, physical thickness associated with it. Uh, and as, as along, similarly, you have some mass associated with it, right? It's gradually it's not gradually, it's continuously changing, but rapidly changing, right? That's the main characteristic of this discontinuity this per se. So then the question becomes, right, how do you go from this? We know physically it has a thickness, it has some mass associated with it, material associated with it, right? And go from that to what we know or what we use as a mathematical discontinuity to model these features, right? How do you do so, so that it is both kinematically and dynamically consistent, right? Both the model represents what is there physically, right? Uh, so going back to the same thing, right? Essentially, you have physically, here I'm representing more in the terms of interface. Uh, this part of it is because it's, easier, at least for me, but I feel like for you guys as well, to see it compared to some other more complex features. Uh, and so it helps to digest the content more easily, right? So again, going back to the same fact, right? You have this physical interface and this sometimes often refused to, uh, referred to as, as diffused interface or region because the material diffuses into the other. There's not like a sharp interface, right? But the question then becomes, right, going back to the same thing, how do you do so going from the physical interface to a mathematical interface, right? And the point of saying that it has to be kinematically and dynamically the same is like, how do you do so that the mass, momentum, and energy, all those quantities are conserved between these physical interfaces and a mathematical interface, right? And all then just to keep saying out that I'm saying interface, but as presented earlier, right, this is a more broader than the material interface. It's referred to any form of singularity that you have. Right? So this is where Gibbs came into play, right? In some few hundred years back, he had the forethought of seeing things ahead of time, right? Uh, so he had presented some an approach and something called as the dividing surface, right? And he specifically applied that approach for uh, material interface, right? 
we are mechanical engineers so unfortunately we don't use this as much chemical engineers are more aware of this so it's like good to collaborate between different areas right they use more of this uh, and are more aware of this right so essentially he said like yeah what you can do is like if you have two materials there's a this gap between there i am defining a dividing surface a surface essentially which creates a division between one side is homogeneous the other side is homogeneous and this interface has the properties has it's itself depending if it's a fluid right so that itself is a fluid but it's like a surface right and it will have its own properties right so it will have its own mass it will have its own viscosity pressure and also you have its own governing equation right you have a mass equation for it or conservation of energy and momentum for it right so that is what his kind of forethought there so with that in mind right we so when he said it right part of it was uh it was more of a foresight into things uh and he doing things backwards rather than having a full so he presented the idea out there right he put the idea out there uh but what was still lacking in some sense was a robust mathematical way to go from physical to the mathematical interface right that's where kind of we put in some thoughts into it uh and essentially seeing that when you do that properly mathematically you can actually extend that approach to things outside of just material interface right and to simply put right it is essentially if you how do you go from something that is you're in a three dimensional space right uh, how do you go from that to a surface right if you have a box right all you need to do is you squeeze it and you get a surface right mathematically you do so by integrating it right so you integrate in that one dimension so if you're talking about three dimensional space if you're integrating in you have x y z if you integrate in z direction you're essentially collapsing that dimension and you're just left with x and y at that point right uh -huh. so that's kind of what is shown here in the two plots right if you integrate that quantity you can get essentially some kind of discontinuity but by doing so properly you are preserving if it's mass you're preserving that mass which is assigned to that discontinuity out there right so i think so i had shown this to some of you guys in the in your class like when i was subbing for dr mekon there right uh, because one of the things he had pointed out in his notes which was pretty good i didn't i mentioned it to them like i should have probably the professor who taught me i should have paid more attention but it took me to the end of my doctoral to figure out the fact that when you say the infinitesimal volume or the delta volume goes to zero it's not necessarily always a point right you can have a sheet of paper and that also has a volume of zero right so it all depends on which dimension you are squeezing across right so in this case i'm kind of showing two examples of how you can think about it right one is the approach i was talking about you just squeeze it and then you get a surface right the other is think about it like if you have two square boxes right so two three dimensional surfaces the intersection of two three dimensional surface is a two dimensional surface right for people who are big bang theory fans right uh, you might have heard sheldon mention uh, abbots flatland a couple of times right um, it's a math it's a not necessarily a fantasy book but it's like a mathematical construct of a disciple where everything is squeezed in one dimension so you're living in a world that is completely flat and everything is two dimensional which is kind of this concept right you just squeeze it down and how does it work right so going back to the fact right often we are looking at of oh, the first thing probably from all the examples you might have thought was oh all of these discontinuities are surfaces right but that's not it right you have this continuities you can keep on going lower in dimensions right and that's kind of when it says the hypersurface per se that's just a mathematical terminology using for your one dimension lower than the dimensional space that you are in so if you are three dimensional world the hypersurface is a two dimensional surface right so similarly if you go if you are living in a two dimensional world the hypersurface is a one dimensional line right 
So similar to if you, how do you go, right? You went from a three-dimensional surface, you squeezed it, you got a surface, uh, surface, right? Now, if you squeeze it in the second dimension, again, what you'll get, you'll get a line, right? And similarly, if you think about intersection of objects, right? If you intersect two surfaces, what do you get, right? If you have always seen a cardboard box, right? Two surfaces, what will it make? It makes a line, right? And this is just another example of it going along with this, like two bubbles, right? When you have the ring around it, that's a line there. So probably you guess what's coming up next, right? If you collapse the line, what do you get? You get a single dot or a point, right? Uh, and same with your intersection of two lines will create a dot. It's kind of seen here in the box and also in a triple uh, three bubble example here, right? But these are things that you are probably seeing. I've shown it all with respect to bubbles, right? But these are there in other examples as well that you are probably encountering in different aspects of yours. Just you have to think and relate it that way. So all of these exam three examples that I've or, or mentioned, discontinuities in three dimensions I've mentioned, are all forms of discontinuities, right? It has the same issue that we are talking about, right? These are mathematically represented as discontinuity, but physically it has a thickness, it has material associated with it, right? So now we go back to some equations that I have avoided for so long, right? okay? So Leibniz rule for, you probably know about it, or even if you don't know about it, you have used it at some point, right? Essentially, it is essentially accounting for changes inside a control volume over a boundary and the flux through it, right? This is kind of the mathematical basis of the next thing, which probably you guys would know, is the Reynolds transport theorem, right? Okay, so that forms the mathematical basis of Reynolds transport theorem, right? It's one Reynolds transport theorem. It's a limiting case of the Leibniz rule per se, right? So essentially, what does the Reynolds transport theorem mention, right? It accounts for, for how much of some quantity will change in time within a set system versus how much flux is coming in and out, right? It, it kind of conserves that quantity. It can be any quantity, mass, momentum, energy that's given by this quantity term phi out here, right? So essentially the bottom equation is the same as the top. It's just written in a more generalized form where M is always the dimension we are talking about. So we are living in a three-dimensional world, we are living in a two-dimensional world or a one-dimensional world, right? So we had I kind of presented the approach of like, how do you go from a 3D to 2D? Yeah, you're collapsing it, you can integrate it, right? So when you collapse it, you know, you're going, doing same thing and showing more mathematically how it's done, right? So essentially the top line, uh, the top equation is the same equation, the Reynolds transport theorem, just written for 2D surface, so that you guys then get too overwhelmed, uh, right? And essentially the flux term, right? The flux coming in through the boundaries of the system has been separated for this box case into two ones, right? One that is going through the vertical surfaces and the other that is going to the horizontal surface, right? And part of the separation which you'll see is because we are going to squeeze this top surface, right? So we are making a distinction between the surface that is going to get squeezed versus that is not going to get squeezed, right? So then from here, you are essentially approaching that, right? And you are doing that by integrating in this direction that is over here, the y direction, yeah. Right. So by doing so, by integrating in that direction, you're essentially removing any dependencies in that direction or dimension. Right. What you end up getting is this equation here and re don't get bogged down by too much of the, the dimensions on top of written. Right. Essentially, this equation is same as a standard or analogous to the 3D Reynolds transport equation. Right. The first few terms up to here. Right. You have a term that accounts for, oh, how much that quantity is changing inside that surface, and then what is the flux coming in and out of the surface, right? But then you see that you get an additional term here, which is the so-called jump term that you get, which is talking about 
what happens to this quantity going jumping from here to this vector, right? So these terms up to here are all representing our surface quantities, right? Still, so in all two dimensional work, but this jump quantity, which is kind of the discontinuity per se, uh, is in the three dimensional realm still. So that way you have kind of a representation of now the Reynolds transfer theorem that accounts for this discontinuity, right? I think so. This kind of reminds me again in Dr. McCon's class, he had mentioned like. Does, does, does phi have to have a certain regularity for that to hold or no? No, not, not in this case, because the, the beginning was with the fact that there's no discontinuity. Everything is, you have. So so phi is smooth. Yeah, so phi is smooth because that's the initial part we are coming from is like there's nothing discontinuous. But once you're integrated, then you have this jump term that is accounting for that. Uh, and so then, yeah, so it becomes like if you're talking about shocks and stuff, right? You have the velocity jump or thermal jump in material interface, then that, this is that term accounting for that actual jump. But then you hold this trans, uh, standard transport theorem still in the surface. And yeah, getting back to what Dr. McCann's class, he had mentioned like, Divergence theorem, you technically, I guess I tend to forget that it cannot be applied on discontinuous fields, right? There's that assumption going into that by default. Same for Reynolds transport theorem and all of those, stuff, right? You can't so, directly. So phi is differentiable and all that. Yeah, it, yeah. Okay. Because that's, we were going from the fact that physically there is no discontinuity. And then we are coming to the approach of like, if you want to model something that is discontinuous, how do you go from there? The phi itself is not discontinuous as a result, because physically you don't have that. Uh, so then this produces a Reynolds transport theorem that can apply to a discontinuous surface, right? And so as you have mentioned, that this is m minus one dimension. So you can go from, so you will have a corresponding lower dimension equation for surface to line, line to dollar point. So you keep on, you get going down each and every dimension. So this is the same equation now just presented more in a general way. So essentially saying that, that you have the divergence of flux through the surface, which is similar to the normal Reynolds transport theorem, but then the direction of flux on the normal to that discontinuity is created or observed as a jump in that quantity. So yeah, that's where I guess, yeah, it's kind of hard to show now, but like, the whole thing about Abbott's flatland and Big Bang theory and Sheldon talking about it. He talks about like, how do you go? If you have squeezed everything, you can go out of the world or that space and then come back because you're going into the third dimension and coming back again. Right? This kind of looks like a sci-fi movie. Just, just so I understand. Oh, sorry. When you say squeeze, it just basically means that there's a control volume that there's nothing physically being squeezed. Exactly. No, nope, nothing physically being okay. squeezed because that's what we were trying to come to is like, physically, there is no discontinuity. It's for mathematically, we use it to represent a discontinuity, right? So that's why it's like control volume we are squeezing. Okay. So we are squeezing every material in that mathematically. Okay, so when you do the squeezing, right? So at the end of the day, you're trying to uh, replicate a system that it's not just a discontinuity, but you have a homogeneous system around it and discontinuity is generally embedded in it, right? Uh, so for instance, you have, and that's kind of like, how do you do that consistently, right? So now that we know we can squeeze a interface or a discontinuous feature, so-called like physical feature, and create it with a mathematical discontinuity interface, how do you do it completely for a system that has the homogeneous material in it as well, right? So, so the kind of we lay down three steps, you know. So if you think about you have two materials, medium B and medium A, and then you have this region here, that's where the transition happens from properties of from medium B to properties of medium A, right? So by doing that integration in the normal direction, right, or so-called squeezing, right, you have squeezed that to a line or a surface, right? But one of the things 
that is often we talk about as well and often overlooked when we do simple problems here, right? When you're squeezing this and representing as a discontinuity, right? Think about a material interface, right? Your original system was this, right? And the final thing that you generally end up drawing a sketch is this, right? Right. So this is that squeezed interface, right? When you're squeezing it, you're technically creating a void, right? Right. You don't have that material anymore. But in physical, or when you write a problem in paper, right, you're filling that void with same material as B and A, right? So you're abstractly, ad hocly adding material to it. It's a very sliver of material in most cases that you're working with, so you don't care as much, right? Uh, so it does, it works perfectly fine, but you are essentially adding material into your system. Uh, so everything. So a quick question. So. It's not like that 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 surf that the surface maybe may be that you create that you could that its response would govern the response in, in those in those bordering regions. Like it's an effective area. Like let's say shell theory when you use the midplane to prescribe the response of the of the shell, right? But the shell is still there. It's just you, 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 when you analyze it, you use the midplane. Yes. And anything off the midplane is covered by a response of the midplane. Is it similar here or no? I would I kind of don't recollect much of shell theory at the top of my head, to be honest. Uh, but I would say not really uh, from what I'm getting from you. Uh, because the path where these two interacts, right, if I go back. Right, it goes back to this this jump term and this surface quantity, right? So think about you have the normal Reynolds transport there, you have normal mass conservation going on here on the surface, right? It has a link to the three-dimensional phase through this jump quantity, right? So this is part of the equation. So thing that is happening outside is connected to what is happening inside and vice versa. So if there is some dynamics oh, on okay. the surface. So, so, so you consider it just to be medium A, medium B. So it's a surrogate description. Yeah. And it introduces the discontinuity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So going back to this idea, so you essentially when you represent something in this form, right? you kind of are accidentally or unintentionally added material or matter to it uh, when you're doing that. So in order for this system to be exactly the same as this, you technically have to kind of account for this added matter or literally if you have to make it exactly the same, you have to take it out at some point, right? So that's kind of part of where the whole Gibbs dividing surface and his theory came into place where he had accounted for that excess material there and he accounts it and assigns it to that discontinuity or interface there. So that way the two systems are consistent, right? So this is essentially kind of saying the same thing that I had mentioned here, right? Uh, in a more elaborate or like summarized way. So to more elaborately show, right? So if you have <coughs> the system, that initial system that you have, you have a sharp change in the properties. It can be density, temperature, any quantity, right? The other thing that we sometimes often assume, right, is I should have, I should press it. You generally, if you have the blue line and the green line, right, that's the homogeneous quantity, say that's density, right? You often, if you have to show how those are connected, you often end up saying that, oh, those are just directly connected with a straight line, just with a tangent, right? You don't think about, you can have this peak out there, right? A sudden peak and come down or vice versa, it can happen that way, right? And this is, and it's interesting that when we I'll show an example later on about pressure and surface tension, right? Uh, it, and this is not something just abstractly created that there is there. I have examples to show you that physically this happens, right? It's not always that the densities just have to connect between the two dots exactly, uh, straight linearly per se. You can have abrupt uh, functions in it or any arbitrary functions in it, right? 
And the other common assumption that people make is right, when you're representing, uh, for instance, an interface, right? You tend to assign it exactly at the geometrical midpoint of the diffuse region of the physical thing, right? And that is also an assumption that you're making. It doesn't have to be at that central location. It can be shifted to the right, shifted to the left, to the, all the way to the edge of the homogeneous material. Okay, so going back to that, if you go squeeze it, you have that dot point there, right? But what you essentially represent in standard problems is this form of things, right? You have the two lines all the way coming to the interface or density, homogeneous material. So essentially you adding that material needs to be accounted for, right? So best way to sometimes look at some of these quantities is for the example here, right? Uh, one of the things uh, presented here is mass because I feel like that's the most tangible thing for people to see. Uh, so when you talk about mass in the two dimensional space, right? So mass always stays the mass, right? Well, you have the corresponding intensive quantity that is the density there, right? And you divide it always like mass per unit volume. You say unit volume because you are living in a three dimensional space, right? Uh, but if you are integrating in one of those dimensions, right? You can mathematically show that then this mass or the standard density, right? Is no longer mass per volume, it becomes mass per area, right? So that becomes the equivalent ex uh, expression of a surface quantity in that that is going to be used in those governing equations for describing surface discontinuities out there. And how do you go about it is essentially you have integrated it to a line, but then you have added this extra excess quantity. So what you're doing is you're finding how much excess you have and that excess is assigned to that interface. So that way that interface has the correct mass uh, that was initially with the physical system to begin with, right? So it will take, depending on if you're thinking about the medium A, medium B and the mass of the interface, then the two systems, the mathematical expression of it and the physical system are the same. And here is kind of the example I was telling about to show, right? So this is density plots from our molecular dynamic simulations where essentially I've created different miscibilities, right? So I've enforced or forced it to mix at a certain way. So it's the ideal way I was talking about, like if it's zero mixing, you make it super hydrophobic thermal. So there is no mixing happening between these two fluids, right? It goes all the way to zero and then you go to the other fluid, right? Here is some partial mixing and same here, right? So over here, you'll see like the, this is the sum of the two quantities, right? Through this region where the interface physically is there, right? There is no extra mass per se, right? Right? So then this represents more of the zero mass interface that we always use, right? So what we are overlooking when we are doing the standard form of representation of an interface is, right? We are actually always representing a special case of an interface, which is kind of this, right? But in general, there are different forms of interfaces depending on how you change the miscibilities of the two fluids, right? So over here, if you change slightly the miscibility, you see there's a bump in the mass, right? So anything excess of this would be like a positive mass, right? That needs to be added onto the interface, assigned to the interface, so that the two physical system and the mathematical modeling of it is seen. Uh, on the other hand, on this case, where you go to the hydrophobic super case, right? This actually goes all the way down, right? So it's essentially kind of a negative mass that you have to assign to that so that the two systems are the system and the model are the same, the physical system and the model are the same. So something that has been, people use it often and, uh, and probably don't relate it is talking about surface tension, right? Everybody has heard surface tension at some point of time that has some construct of it, right? Uh, and so to show that this, you're using these aspects in some places, but you have not 
necessarily associated that. Even I didn't do that, but that before I went through some of this material, right? So what is surface tension, right? Surface tension, if you look at it, is essentially pressure in two dimensional surface, right? So it is, you are bringing the pressure down to that two dimensional plane, like in a lower dimension there. And the way you calculate surface tension for a diffuse region, right? And this is widely known or thing is, right? You essentially do the same thing. You have this pressure, right? One of the other assumptions that you make in homogeneous media, you always say pressure is isotropic, right? That isotropy, so pressure in the normal direction is the same as pressure in the tangential direction, same as all directions, right? right? When you come to an interface or discontinuous region, that is no longer isotropic, that assumption breaks there, right? It's, it becomes iso an isotropic. So essentially, pressure in the direction normal to the so called physical discontinuous feature is different from the, that in tangential direction. Right, and as the difference in this pressure integrated over this region, right, is what is called as the mechanical surface tension. So if you are given a diffuse region, this is a very standard uh, process of finding the surface tension from a physical interface uh, of two fluids, essentially, uh, normal to it. But if you see, the basic idea is essentially similar to what we have been talking about with the Gibbs dividing surface out there. Right, you're finding how much excess this essentially what is it doing? It's just finding the excess of this quantity out here in that region. Uh, and in this case, this is pressure, right? We had done some work back during my doctoral work, and like the the left hand side is the description of a stress tensor in a standard bulk fluid, right? The right hand side is description of the so-called surface fluid and Busanesk came up with this expression and it has been later used for a lot of things, right? But if you see that the two expression is essentially very analogous to each other, right? The only difference is everything on the right hand side is written in left hand side, sorry. Left hand side is written uh, in terms of surface quantities, right? Surface stress, surface velocity, and instead of pressure, you'll see you have surface tension out there, all right? So if you go through the process, right? If you try to find from the surface, the stress tensor, you find the mechanical pressure, right? I guess one of the other things forgotten is, it's always assumed mechanical pressure is same as thermodynamic pressure, right? And that's because you assume that there's no compressibility, there's no dilatation happening, right? So you find mechanical pressure, which is just the trace of the stress tensor, so the diagonal of the stress tensor, right? But actually, at the end of the day, you find that the mechanical pressure is equal to the thermodynamic pressure, and then there's this quantity R of that, which is the compressibility or dilatation that's accounted for. Generally, that kind of drops out, and then this becomes equal, right? And you can do the same for surface tension here, right? So going back to the fact that Mechanical surface tension is not necessarily always equal to the thermodynamic surface tension, right? It depends on if you have some kind of surface dilatation in the uh, in the region around it. And that's kind of part of the work that we did was like trying to validate that, is it true that there are a difference between mechanical and thermodynamic surface tension when you're coming to a case where you create a surface dilatation, right? One of the place of interest for us, back when I was doing my doctoral work was the moving contact line, right? It's essentially uh, where that interface, fluid fluid interface meets the solid wall, right? There's two surfaces meeting there, so you're creating a line, right? Uh, and that's kind of a whole different issue in itself because the so-called famous no slip boundary condition doesn't hold at the moving contact line, it breaks down. Uh, so what you end up seeing, right, if you look at the so-called mechanical surface tension that you calculate using that formula of difference in pressure and integrating it, right, and then you find that so thermodynamic surface tension, which is generally equal outside or far away from it, right, and calculate the surface dilatation term, right, you see that as you get closer to the contact line, right, 
essentially, if you have a droplet, if it's an interplate, think about a corner, right? If it's a flow, it's going to hit there, right? You cannot penetrate this wall on the corner, right? It has to decelerate at some point, right? So that it act, it satisfies a no penetration condition, and then it has decelerates and turns up, right? So essentially, that deceleration is changing spatial acceleration here. So velocity slows down as fluid will, as it gets to that point, right? So this term is no longer zero, right? And hence you see that this surface tension kind of decreases when you're at one of the so-called trailing edges. On the other side, you have it increasing. So you have it surface tension actually increasing as a result of it. So you see the difference in surface tension, the mechanical and thermodynamic surface tension as a result of it kind of validating some of the things. Joseph, we have about five minutes. I should be pretty much done. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and similarly, this was this, <coughs> I guess I should go back to this. So this was the other test case where we ran, right? So if people have heard about Marangoni flow and things like that, so if you have an interface, if you somehow create surfactants in it, so you create a surface tension gradient because of the composition of gradients, right? You can create a flow tangential to it, right? Uh, what we are trying to do is kind of the opposite of it, right? So it's in, in that case, Marangoni flow surface tension gradient is creating or driving the flow, right? Here, what we are doing is we are essentially creating kind of a nozzle, right? You're changing the shape or the area of it. So you are trying to accelerate the flow or decelerate it as it goes along, right? So you're creating the spatial acceleration. And then what we are looking at is, does that affect the surface tension, right? There is no other material added to change the composition of it. So, yeah, so that's kind of, you see the velocity field, there's a deceleration, then acceleration happening. So the velocity increases and decreases, and then you see the surface tension kind of follows that same path. Right? So the mechanical surface tension as a result also, there's a change in that as the, the flow itself accelerates or decelerates, right? So this is uh, some of the examples here given to kind of validate some of the theories that were there, right? But this is where you guys come into play, right? Or things ahead of it, right? I have everything I've presented from the most describing the methodology to some of the validations were with respect to material interfaces, right? Uh, but essentially, right, what is a material interface or any of the discontinuities that we think about, right? We think about shock or combustion front, right? Essentially, you have a small length scale region and you have a sudden rapid changes in some quantity, right? It can be temperature, it can be pressure, it can be density, any quantity that you think about, right? Although in physically, there's a rapid change, it is still continuously changing, right? right? So that is how you define this so-called discontinuous feature, right? So there are two things that we define, right? You have a physical discontinuity that we are talking about, right? Material, shock, front, et cetera. But there are other things that we call it as apparent discontinuities, where you mathematically model something as a discontinuous feature just for math simplicity of modeling, right? So you do boundary layer, and you often you represent boundary layer at a vortex sheet, right? A uh, vortex sheet is generally discontinuous in tangential velocity, but you don't have to do it. You do it for modeling simplicity, right? So here I just kind of list some of the some of the different features per se, and then what are the quantities that are discontinuous across? You have densities. So if you have a combustion front, you have a temperature discontinuity across it, right? Uh, if you have a gravity wave front, you have the density discontinuous. You have the tangential velocity discontinuous. So different features have different things discontinuous, um, and then. These are the so-called apparent discontinuities. So you have vortex sheet, you have entrainment sheet, right? These are things that are not necessarily physically from your perspective discontinuous, uh, but you do it for modeling simplicity, right? So for people who have dealt with vortex sheet, right? Uh, when you're using vortex sheet methods, right? One of the constraints of it is, right? It will never be able to capture drag. So vortex sheets generally all quite often used for like and you're trying to uh, model like flow over an air foil, right? But one of the constraints with it, right? It only captures 
or it represents a discontinuity in tangential direction. It, so it essentially it doesn't capture drag per se, cannot account for it. Uh, but one of my colleagues work on something that is similar to it, but it's the entrainment sheet, but it also from the same methodology that we used, which accounts for the discontinuing the normal velocity as well, right? So it's not necessarily you have the no penetration condition directly as per se. And then if you do that, then that entrainment sheet will account for the drag in, uh, drag on that surface next to it. So that's essentially, we have just done a couple of things, but there's so much more that can be done where you guys come into play, right? So essentially, just to quickly summarize how much three minutes we have, you still have a couple yeah, minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay. So yeah. It's, it's 10 good. till if anybody needs to leave to go to the next decade, feel free to do so. Okay, yeah, so essentially to summarize, right? Uh, so, so the current models that are out there, right, are kind of at best semi-empirical when you're talking about modeling uh, some of these discontinuous features, right? Uh, Gibbs came up with this idea of or thought of the dividing surface, right, which is kind of the best thing that is out there that could accurately, the most accurately represent some of these quantities, right, or features. But what his was limited, or that approach was mainly very limited to a material of phase interface. Right. Uh, what we went up is like find out or how more robustly or mathematically derive or present that equation or the, the dividing surface, right? Uh, by so called collapsing it by mathematically integrating across that dimension. Uh, and when you do so, uh, you get what we term it as the extended dividing hypersurface, right? The reason we say it hypersurface is because when you say surface, everybody thinks about a 2D plane or a paper or something like that, right? But a hypersurface, like this is not limited to just a surface. You can go all the way to a line to a point, right? So that keeps the generalization out there. And then finally, is right, uh, this kind of approach, because it has material properties, right, associated with it, and it has its own governing equations. So I presented the Reynolds transfer theorem for that, right? If you have the Reynolds transfer theorem, you can find all the conservation equations, right? From mass, momentum, energy, associated with all these features, like in different dimensions out there, right? And then you can find corresponding surface quantities out there, right? So I showed the Boussinet equation that is chemical engineers use it more widely than we do, right? It had a surface viscosity associated with it, right? We don't talk about surface viscosities ever, right? Uh, but the actual instruments that have actually compute surface viscosity is of an interface as well. Uh, so when you have that, then you have a more accurate representation of this discontinuous features out there. Uh, as a result, it's more kinematically and dynamically more consistent or a more accurate representation of the physical system. And yep, uh, at the end, I just presented material interfaces. I showed that there are more things out there that this approach can be applied to. So with that, I open it up for questions. Does the hypersurface have to be constant across or can it have different properties of the number? It can. It doesn't have to be. It's just like any other homogeneous material you think about. But that's where it happens, right? The, that's the other thing, right? In the hypersurface, if you're thinking of a surface, right, just a 2D plane, if there's a sharp change in density, like a material change, right? Then you can collapse that dimension and create a line. So you have a discontinuity on that surface itself. So that's the line discontinuity. And then you can do the same at the point, right? So you have, you can have, it allows you to embed discontinuity into a discontinuity in some sense, right? Yes, sir. Just a little comment. You may have already heard this, but for, for people who work in geometry, projective or computation or even differential geometry. In those communities, they've got a very different definition of hypersurface. So you know, this definition doesn't match that. So oh, you get some people that are 
so you showed molecular dynamics serve conditions, right? But the intent of this using these serves is actually to use them in a continuum type of yep. product. Because, well, not you use continuum descriptions, but you introduce the, uh, the small scale uh, behavior by discontinuity of a one dimension lower. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what you do. Um, so, my question is first, what kind of, how smooth does my physical quantity have to be for this method to, 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 to be, uh, I don't know, what, what is valid? Because, so, you know, I could, I could have, normally when I look at, at continuing descriptions, I say I have input data that, that has this regularity and have coefficients that have these regularities, and then I know that my solution has a certain smoothness or roughness, and from that, I can look at my numerical technique and say, this is going to work or it's not going to work, or it's going to work just for certain yeah. limitations. So my immediate question here is, what limitations does this set, let's say, on um, the kind of input data, like right and so, side, like, yeah. like thermal heat sources, things like that? There must be some limitation, right? So the, the limitation comes from the fact, like, like with everything in computation, right? There's a cost to be paid for the accuracy that you need, uh, right? So some other things, limitations, right? You have so-called so surface quantities, right? How do you get some of those surface quantities, right? How do you find the surface viscosity associated with it, right? Uh, so some that's kind of some of the limitation there, right? So if you're talking about thermal, how do you find the surface uh, K value for that, right? The conductivity constants. Uh, so, but, so that is part of it, but then also the other limitation is, right, when you're integrating it, and that's the fact of having something collapse, right, you're losing some description in that dimension, right, some, and that's part of, like, when you're integrating a quantity, you're collapsing it, right, you're use, losing the details, you're not getting any more of the distribution across it at that point, you're using it as a lumped quantity at that point, right, so that information is lost, uh, but Many other times, right, it also depends on the problem that you're trying to model, right? If you are trying to model a problem that is like, I would say, at the length scales of meters and your discontinuity is one nanometer, for instance, right? And the model that you're, or the problem you're solving, somehow that discontinuity does not have direct or indirect effect on the length scales, right? then the accuracy that you're going to get from this with the cost that you're going to pay will be like pointless for you, right? You have to pay a cost to get all that extra inputs of properties in it, right? But the accuracy you're going to get will be negligible or you're not going to get any information, additional information out of it. Oh, okay, actually this touches, but you just said actually touched on my next question is because you're doing a surrogate approach here. Okay, so, yeah. The discontinuity is not there, as you said. It yeah, yeah. It's used over a certain length scale. Yeah. So, you know, I do this business all the time where I place models by others, and then I talk about errors between the two, right? <laughs> With whatever I perceive to be exact and what I replace it with yeah. the surrogate. So my question is, I'm just curious, I, I don't know if the resource is as advanced at this point, but do you have some quantitative information as to what are limitations, what length scales do I need? Let's say, how, how narrow does this diffuse region have to be? What's, what does the scale of that length of that, that diffuse region have to be compared to other scales in the problem? Let's say the scale of the whole problem or the scale of applied loadings or anything like that. Is there any um, educated knowledge about at this point in time. So it must be a limitation, right? The, the, so it's a limitation based on something like, I guess, some of the other works that my advisor had done at some point is like, he called it something as an observability, right? If you think about an instrument, right? The least count of an instrument, right? There's all the, the, you have a resolution of an instrument, right? Right. So below a standard ruler, right? If you take a standard ruler, you can measure up to one millimeter, right? If you find, try to find an information below that, there is arbitrariness, right? Uh, 
then you have to get a more accurate instrument to be able to so you're always kind of math in physical aspects of it right you're limited by the instrument you're using right from the computational standpoint of view you right numerically you're limited by the grid size you're using right so that also assumes some kind of thickness right you well, I take control the grid. Exactly, but if you go smaller and smaller and smaller, at some point it's going to be computationally expensive for you, right? And that's what we are coming to the fact that well, it's. I mean, that's computational expense. I'm talking about accuracy in terms of error. Right? At least so, at some point it was too expensive, I have to give up. But I mean, if I if my, if the diffuse region is too large for me to use this process, the expense is not really an issue. It's I yeah. get a modeling error that is not acceptable. What I do numerically then is kind of a good point. Yeah. So the so the error, personally, I've not come to the, or the research has not come to a point of exactly comparing the errors, uh, but the foundation of it is like, you are still conserving all the proper quantities. If you have done it properly, it should physically represent it. Effectively, it should. It should effectively conserve all the quantities there, right? The, the fact of the errors would originate, like how accurately are you conserving? Like mathematically, the instrument is there, right? Once you're putting it to the numerical application of it, what's the limitation of conserving that quantities there, right? Uh, just, just kind of jump on the same idea that the reference is talking about, again, with the opportunity of different parts of the problem. But just the actual size of the files to be a bigger. Sorry, can you repeat it? Just the size of the molecules that we're talking about be a bigger limiting factor in the accuracy. Yeah, so. So, and that's the part of thing I was trying to, I guess, yeah, like technically there is nothing discontinuous, but right, even you get the finest manufacturing to create a corner, right? The corner will not be mathematically a straight line because you will have an atom there that is spherical in shape, right? But you are just gone at that point to the size of a nucleus, right? Your resolution is that small. Uh, so that's kind of thing, like in physical aspects, there is nothing mathematically discontinuous. Well, I guess that's my, uh, that really is my question is that you were talking about like, oh, because there's some molecules that are going across the surface and there's some of these molecules are in here and some of these molecules are in here. My, in my head, I'm saying, well, then everything really is discontinuous because if you get down to the size of electrons, they are, you know, a every single electron is a discontinuous yeah. thing. Yeah. So. so I don't know, I feel like a scale. Yeah, so it's all relative in that sense, right? If you're looking at a problem that is, and that's when some of the things that, when I mentioned the definition of like a discontinuous, like if compared to your homogeneous <laughs> material, you're looking at a quantity, if it's, if compared to that length scales of the problem, if it is happening at a much smaller length scales and much rapidly, then generally you model it as a discontinuity. That's what we do generally when it comes to material interfaces and shock fronts or the com combustion fronts or gravity fronts, right? You generally tend to model that as discontinuities because of the length scale issues. The, um, and but this essentially tries to fill the gap of just doing it semi-empirically or ad hocly to, if you want, you can do it more systematically whereas more accurately modeled. And then just as a closing statement, I'm really looking forward to your paper where you explain to us what happened the big bang. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> At some point, yeah. <laughs> and that's another thing, right? Yeah, to so see and think about being for some. Oh, no. We can so take this, this outside maybe, of it. Right. So maybe this is a good stopping point. Yeah. We'll stop the recording and we'll retire to the ME Zoo and keep on talking about it.